Um, hi, if Israel is justified in killing civilians because of the acts of terror committed by Hamas, why isn't Hamas justified in doing what it did? Because Israel is keeping 13,000 children. It has tried them in military courts. Since the establishment of Israel, 55,000 Palestinian homes have been bulldozed. So why isn't Hamas justified in doing what it did if we use your logic? Um, well, so I'm going to answer your question, then I'm going to ask you a question if you don't mind. Is that all right? So, the, the, so my answer is that Israel would not be justified in killing Palestinian civilians because of the actions of terrorists. Israel would be justified in attempting to kill terrorists, and civilian casualties are a cost of war. That is just a reality of life. During World War II, there were 70,000 Brits who died during the Blitz bombing, and there were 2 million Germans who died, civilians, who died during World War II. And I don't see a lot of monuments in Britain because of the 2 million civilians who died in Germany. The costs of war are brutal. They are terrible. They are horrifying. There is a vast difference in moral scope between deliberately going into a civilian area and murdering everyone you can find and trying to kill a terrorist who is deliberately hiding beneath a civilian area, hiding their rockets in civilian areas, starving their own people. There is a vast difference. Okay, so let me, now I get to ask my question, if you don't mind. So my question is, do you believe that there is a moral difference between Hamas going into, for example, Kfar Aza and murdering entire families and Israel attempting to target terrorists and accidentally hitting civilians? Israel is effectively doing the same because Gaza is the most densely populated region in the world. There are 15,000 people per square mile. So does Hamas get immunity the because the they're there? So Hamas gets immunity. So Israel, you, Israel has killed 3,500 children in the past three weeks. That's so, more children. That's more children than have died so, in conflicts around the world in each of the last so, four so just, years. So just to be clear, your logic is that if you're a terrorist group located in a densely populated community and you hide behind civilians, you're now immune. Where are the children meant to go? So you're immune. Okay. That's Where a violation of the go? Geneva Conventions, but okay. You're, you're 20, now immune. Your logic is that if you're a Hamas terrorist... Sorry, sorry, since 2005, 23 out of every 24 conflict deaths have been Palestinian. I don't see any moral equivalency there. It's clearly unjust what the IDF has been doing to the Palestinians because there's a vast disparity between the number of Palestinians being killed and the number of Israelis. I mean, I would the certainly hope that is Israel huge. is killing more Hamas. This isn't members. a conflict. I've... This isn't a conflict. This is one-sided ethnic okay, cleansing. So, again... I'm just asking you, if based on the numbers, more Germans died than Brits in World War II, did that mean that British, the British were wrong in World War II? Because they did. Many more Germans died than Brits. Based on the numbers, does that mean that Britain was wrong in World War II? Britain wasn't bombing civilian, civilians. There's a clear you, you difference. Should, you, should talk to, you should talk to the people in Dresden, but there's you can't because they're dead. There's a clear difference. Well, I agree that war is horrible, but this is not a just war. What Israel is doing is not a just war. There is a difference between Wait, fighting uh, oh, the on. Nazis. So it is, so it is not a, a just war. To, it, fighting it, the Nazis. It is, not, it, is not, it is not a just war when you fight a war against people who murder 1,500 of your civilians and take 233 of them, at last count, captive into tunnels. It is not a just war to obliterate them. Please Isra name a just war. Israel's been killing civilians for the past 75 years. And there was no headlines about it, and there were, nobody said that the Palestinians were Israel justified. Israel does not purposefully kill civilians. Palestinian terrorists do. Israel has if, not purposefully if Israel killed put down civilians. Its guns Are you tomorrow, willing to stand by a, that statement? If Israel put down its guns tomorrow, there would be a second Holocaust. If the Palestinians put down their guns tomorrow, there would be a Palestinian state. That is the reality. Just um, the last question, and if, uh, if I'm fine to answer. So, uh, your solution to climate change is adaptation, so more technologies, which is great. Uh, my question is when it comes to actually developing countries that are bearing most of the cost of climate disasters and climate change, and they do not obviously have the money to implement all of those high costing technologies that the developed world can, what would be solution for them? I mean, the solution for them presumably would be in terms of mitigating against climate change, the, the building seawalls for them too. I mean, if, the, if, if we can give our foreign aid to corrupt foreign governments to embezzle, then we can certainly attempt to build some seawalls in low-lying coastal areas of third world countries. That seems like if you're going to give foreign aid, that seems like not a terrible place to, to give the foreign aid. But as far as I, I, I do reject the generalized argument that the first world owes it to the third world because of climate change, because the first world is the first world and the third world is the third world. I just fundamentally reject the idea that capitalism has been a process of exploitation of the third world and enrichment of the first world when literally half the world's global poor disappeared because they are not global poor anymore by, by UN standards over the course of the last 50 years, thanks entirely to the magic of capitalism. So you can't take the benefits and then reject the downsides. I don't think it works that way. All right, thank you, and free Palestine.
Wh which part? <laughs> really? It's 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 a, it's a serious question. What what is it? Um, I'm not going to comment on that. I mean, I saw you say "from the river to the sea," so you can just say it out loud. Yeah, from the river to the sea. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I appreciate I appreciate the idea that the Jewish state should be wiped completely off the map with a concomitant loss of life. But we're worried about climate change and the humanitarian aspects of climate change over the course of the next hundred years. Sure. Okay. Uh, the idea that Israel does not want to end the conflict is belied by the history of what just happened with the Gaza Strip. So when we talk about settlements, for example, Israel did have settlements inside the Gaza Strip. There were 8,000 Jews who were living inside the Gaza Strip in Gush Katif uh, up until 2005. They, they, they withdrew all of those people. I mean, took them literally out of their homes. Uh, and the result was not the burgeoning of a, of a better attitude toward the state of Israel with regard to, for example, you know, the, the Palestinian population in Gaza. In fact, it was more radical in Gaza than it was in the West Bank. Uh, the, the, the result was obviously the election of Hamas, the, the October 7th attacks, in which unfortunately many civilians took place, uh, took part in the October 7th attacks. There's video of people rushing who are civilians and dressed in civilian clothing into uh, Israeli well, villages. Not always the same thing. <laughs> well, no, no, that is, that is 100% <laughs> true, obviously. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, Area C and Israel's you know, supposed deep and abiding desire for territorial expansion in Area C. Area C, so for, for those who are not familiar with the Oslo Accords, and again, this is getting very abstruse, but the Oslo Accords are broken down into three areas of the West Bank. Area A is under full Palestinian control. That'd be like Janine and Nablus, the, the major cities, for example. There's Area B, which is mixed Israeli-Palestinian control, where Israel provides uh, some level of military security and control. Uh, and then there's Area C. And Area C was like to be decided later. It was left up for possible concessions to the Palestinian Authority if the Oslo Accords had moved forward. Those are disputed territories. There is building taking place in areas he by both actually, no one talks about this, but by, by Palestinians as well as Israelis. Uh, and the the you know question is whether if Israel stopped building, there have been many settlement freezes in the past, including some undertaken by Netanyahu. Netanyahu uh, and, and it actually has not done one iota of good in moving the ball forward in terms of actual negotiations. Again, the, the biggest problem is that the leadership for Palestinians has spent every day since really 67, it's not even 48, because after 40, between 48 and 67, Jordan was in charge of the West Bank and Egypt was in charge of the Gaza Strip. And at no point did either of those powers say, hey, maybe we ought to hand this over to an independent Palestinian state, which was originally the division that was that was promoted by the UN partition plan in 47. The, because of that, uh, the, the leadership post 67 and really starting in 64, the Palestine Liberation Organization was founded in 64 and it called for the liberation of the land in 64, they had the West Bank and they had the Gaza Strip. So they're talking about Tel Aviv. Uh, when it was founded in, in 64, the basic idea as you know, kind of indicated by that was Israel will not exist. And that was a promise that's been made by pretty much every Palestinian leader in Arabic to the people that they are talking to. Yasser Arafat famously would do this sort of thing. He'd speak in English and talk about how he wanted a two-state solution. And then he'd go back to his own people and say, this is a Trojan horse and we're gonna... If Israel could, if you think that Israeli parents want to send their kids at the age of 18 to go and monitor Janine and Nablus and be in, in Khan Yunus, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Israelis do not want that. In fact, Israelis didn't want that so much that they allowed rockets to fall in their cities for full on 18 years in order to avoid sending soldiers en masse back into the Gaza Strip. True, but I think Israel does want to continue to expand settlements into the West Bank, right? They want to continue to build. They want to have the, okay, all so, of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as well. Well, I mean, East Jerusalem has already been annexed. So East Jerusalem is, according to Israel, a part of Israel. That's not a settlement. Sure. Okay, so there, there's that. With, with regard to, you know, does Israel have an interest in expanding settlements in the West Bank? What, why would they not until there's a peace partner? Sure, that's Meaning what like I mean. For, but I'm saying as long as the conflict continues, like, because even when you talk no, but you, about what, the, you, but No, but your suggestion is that they're incentivizing the conflict to continue so they can grab more land. Well, no, let me but be I, very clear. I don't yeah. think there's like a plan. Like, so some people say, for instance, uh, they'll take that one quote from Netanyahu and they'll try to say that like he was funding the people in the Gaza Strip by allowing Qatari money to come in, even though he was actually speaking in opposition to Abbas, allowing the Gaza Strip to fall for Netanyahu to clear it out for him and they give it back, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying, I'm not claiming those theories. I'm just saying that I think that Israel will take a relatively neutral stance towards conflict in enduring because as long as the conflict endures and as long as the uh, settlements can expand, I think that benefits I think that ultimately benefits Israel. The, 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 I think there would be very, let, let's put it this way. Uh -huh. If suddenly there arose among the Palestinians a deep and abiding desire for peace, approved by a vast majority of the population with serious security guarantees, uh -huh. I think you'd be very hard pressed to find Israelis who would not be willing to at least consider that 
in return like for not like, expanding bathrooms in a fraud. I kind of, agree, I would have agreed with you on October 6th. I think we're probably a year or two oh, away no, from no, that right now. No, though. no, but, yeah. but no, the, the point I'm making is that Israelis now realize that the entire peace process was a sham, meaning the people who are on the other side of the table were using it as a Trojan horse in the first place. The, the death of Oslo <laughs> is not the death of Israeli hopefulness. It's the death of the illusion that on the other side of the table was anyone worth bargaining with. That's what's happening. And that's why you have this sort of insane disconnect right now between the United States and the Israeli government. Again, it's a unity government. No one in Israel is talking about making concessions to the Palestinian Authority for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact that Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah continues to pay actual families of terrorists who kill Jews. Sure, the Mark and, Fund, yeah. Right, and, and the Which fact, is from the, the moderate West Bank. Right, right exactly. Yeah. That's the, the, So, you know, again, like the, the taste in Israel for this is a... If, even the people who are the, the Chilonim, right? Those are the most secular people in Israel, mm -hmm. which was, by the way, the, the place that was attacked on October 7th. I mean, what people should understand is that October 7th was not an attack against settlements in the West Bank. It was an attack on peace villages that were essentially disarmed. And many of these people who were killed were peace activists who were literally trying to work with people in Gaza to get them jobs. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's mind boggling. That's which why is, you've had this ground shift in Israel. The next 20 years in Israel is gonna be about security and economic development, period, end of story. Everything else goes second, third place. Why does leveling Gaza and killing so many civilians, why would that give anyone in Israel any kind of comfort that that would, that would kill off the ideology that fueled Hamas, that it wouldn't actually just lead to an increase in that ideology, more hatred towards Israelis, more hatred towards Jewish people. I've never quite understood what the end game looks like here for Israel that makes Israel more secure. Well, I mean, the end game presumably is security, not a sort of dynamic ideological scoring among a population that right now overwhelmingly supports the October 7th attacks and prior to October 7th, overwhelmingly supported terror attacks against the state of Israel and overwhelmingly supported the destruction of the state of Israel. The sort of idea that more conciliation from Israel was bringing about peaceful conditions with the Palestinian Authority or with Hamas has been obviously proved false by the fact that Israel literally withdrew all IDF forces from the Gaza Strip in 2005. Hamas took control. They spent the last 20 years turning it into a giant terror base. From the Israeli perspective, my assumption is that what they are figuring is degrade Hamas's military capacity such that they cannot be an offensive threat to the state of Israel, and then try to enact some sort of military control of the area sufficient to prevent any future threat from arising from that area. I'm sure that Israel would love to hand the area over to Egypt. Egypt says no. Egypt doesn't want any part of it. Israel would love to hand it over to Jordan. Jordan says no. Jordan doesn't want any part of it. Israel's tried to hand it over to the Saudis, to the UAE, to the United States, to literally anyone. No one wants to run that area specifically because the population is already quite radicalized and was radicalized before October 7th. And so what you're probably going to end up with, and I said this, I think, the first time I appeared on the show, which was shortly after October 7th in, in this context, what you're probably going to end up with is some form of joint military rule in the Gaza Strip in which Israel has the intelligence capacity to go in and conduct raids in, in terror hotbeds the same way that they do right now, for example, in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, places like Janine, places like Nablus. The IDF is constantly attempting to go in and root out terror cells in these particular areas. One of the big flaws that led to October 7th was the fact that Israel had no forces on the ground and no actual intelligence capability inside the Gaza Strip. Hey, Ben Shapiro, I just had a quick question for you. So I, I have a question. Want... Can I see your face or is it like prohibited? Um, I just don't want to associate my face with like my politics. Is there a reason for that? I just don't want like worried about my career. Is that okay? Um, well, it depends about what you're, what you're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I just ask it? Okay. Yeah, you, you can ask it and then we'll determine whether, uh, whether you are a, a person who should not be able to get a job. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So I just want to know how hard was it to like generate, generate like AI generated images of Hamas? So you should take off your mask now. Because not, not really because what you're saying is so anti-Semitic, but just because what you're saying is so unbelievably stupid that I hope employers take a good stock of a person who does something so dumb. So the... No? No, ma no, mask stays on? Mask stays on, yeah, I figured. Okay, there was no AI-generated image. It is a real image. The way that the game works on Twitter right now, because it's been taken over by a lot of Hamas bots, is that if you put a real image of an atrocity, they will then spam that image with community notes. And they'll do that until the algorithm puts a community note on the image. And then they'll screen cap the community note and pretend that the image was AI generated. That image was not only a not AI generated, it was handed to Tony Blinken. That, Im th that image was specifically, I, I wasn't the first person to put it out there. That image was tweeted out by the prime minister of Israel. So, like, again, this is the, the amount of, of just insane bullshit that's being trafficked 
in this, in this information war is truly astonishing. And the fact that there are people who don't want to show their faces, but they do want to say things like that. You know, again, you know, I, you know, I, let's just leave it, we'll leave it at that. This does not appear to be a highly intelligent specimen. Okay. <laughs> if you want to demonstrate that you have skin in the game of the victim-victimizer narrative, what you do is you pick literally the worst example of supposed victims on the planet, and then you declare that they are the victims. So you take Hamas, which is literally the worst people you could declare victims. They are fascists, they, they are the actual new Nazis, they are genocidal maniacs, they habitually engage in the murder of their political opponents, they engaged in mass rape, they, they celebrated the, the murder of children, they triumphantly live-streamed all of this. And they did all of this while siphoning billions of dollars away from the Palestinian people to build hundreds of kilometers of terror tunnels to hide below the civilians so that when Israel had to go in, civilians would have to die in order for Israel to be able to clear the territory. These are not victims. These are just the worst people in modern life. And somehow, the best way to demonstrate that you have skin in the game is to declare that they are actually the victims. If you can maintain that philosophy, man, have you demonstrated your fealty to this perverse worldview if you can actually agree that somehow Hamas are the victims in this situation? Earlier you said that your solution would be to kill all the people in Hamas, correct? All the Hamas members, yes. Well, in a recent video, you showed propaganda shown to Palestinian children as, as well as children... Those are not members of Hamas. They're not members of Hamas. So there are civilians mean, who think evil things who are not members of Hamas. But they were Tons holding guns in the army of Hamas. Yes, and then Hamas has an actual infrastructure. Hamas actually pays people. There are people who actually work for sure. Hamas. So the people who actually work for Hamas, you have to kill. Sure. So those are the people who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Palestinian kids who are indoctrinated in evil things. So the kids holding the guns in the, in the pictures in the, your video shouldn't die? No, they should not die. They're children. Okay. If they point that gun at somebody else, then, then you have to do what you have to do to defend yourself. But that's not the same thing. There is a distinction between being a Hamas member. I mean, obviously, Palestinian Islamic Jihad is fighting members of Hamas. Those sorts of internal terrorist wars have been ongoing for a very, very long time. So when I say Hamas members, I mean Hamas members. So as we stand here, talk today, uh, students are holding a vigil to commemorate the people who died on October 7th. And this event is counter-programming that vigil. Perkei Avot tells us that you can serve God or you can serve yourself. So my question to you is, how are you not serving yourself with this event? Well, since there are hundreds of people who showed up to hear me talk about what's going on, I don't think that it's serving myself per se. I also don't think that I need the money. Uh, so my suggestion would be that there are many ways to commemorate what happened. So the, this notion that I'm somehow ignoring the wishes of the entire Jewish community or large swaths of the Jewish community by coming and speaking about the most vital issue on the most vital day of the last year is insipid. And your insulting attempts to quote Perke Avot at me are frankly uninspired. Will you condemn the deaths of innocent Palestinian civilians in the same way that you do innocent Israeli ones? Absolutely not. And the reason I will not is because the, the killing is not done in the same way or with the same purpose. That's like saying that do I, con do I condemn, do I condemn, that's, that's, that's like saying, will I condemn the the person who murders a baby in their bed by burning them alive the same way that I condemn the police officer who's trying to arrest that person and accidentally kill someone in the process. Of course not. Those are not the same thing, not remotely. And that I'm supposed to equate Israel attempting to make targeted strikes with Hamas literally sending 2,000 terrorists across another nation's border and into civilian areas with no military goal, with no military goal, with purely the goal of murdering those civilians? I don't under, uh, let me ask you, why exactly no, would I'm, you equate... I'm asking you no, questions no, no, well, I mean, Mr. You, got, you got several questions, so I'm, I'm asking... <laughs> yeah, I agree. Let's turn to the Middle East. Um, I know you have very passionate, strong feelings about all this. Where do you think we are with the war? I mean, if you're, if you're being completely honest with yourself, perhaps, do you feel it's reaching a point where Israel has to, at some stage, do some kind of deal? Well, I mean, it depends on the kind of deal that would be on the table. Presumably, any deal that leaves Hamas in power in the Gaza Strip would not be acceptable to the Israeli government, no matter who was leading the Israeli government at this point. No government in Israel could stand on the basis of that after October 7th. And so far as I'm aware, Hamas has not accepted any deal that involves Hamas actually leaving power, its leaders going into exile, and Israel not completely pulling out of the Gaza Strip. So, 
you know, again, there is no deal on the table like that. I think the realistic scenario here is that Israel, because of all the pressure, is going to go slower in Rafah than they otherwise would have, which, frankly, I think is bad policy for the Israelis. I think it's bad policy for the West. This thing could have been over back in March if the West had let Israel find, kind of finish the job in Rafah and then move on to whatever the next thing is. And, of course, that's the other big problem. You and I have discussed this before. What is the next thing? Who's willing to take responsibility right. for the situation in the Gaza Strip other than the Israeli military? It's not the Americans, not the UAE, it's not the Jordanians, not the Saudis, not the Egyptians, none of whom, by the way, will accept any Palestinian refugees under any circumstances, good or bad. So, you know, again, that's an intractable problem. But as far as finishing off Hamas as a functioning, well-organized military machine, the final step of that is finishing things off in Rafah, where there's still at least three battalions of Hamas fighters in Rafah. Of course, the biggest problem for Israel right now actually may not militarily be in the south. The biggest problem for Israel right now is militarily in the north, where Hezbollah, Hezbollah. has really been upping the ante. Yeah, yeah they, they, they obviously believe that their pressure up north is going to force Israel into concessions down south, and they believe that the West is going to continue to pressure Israel even the, in the face of increasingly deadly fire aimed from southern Lebanon into northern Israel. See, where I would slightly take issue with you with this situation with Rafa is that the American intelligence is clear that they believe that Hamas's ability to commit anything like October the 7th again has been completely degraded. They no longer see them as a existential threat of any kind to Israel. And that, of course, you've got hundreds of thousands of innocent women and kids in this refugee camp. And you've also got the remaining members of Hamas deliberately putting themselves around refugees. And almost, I would imagine, hoping that Israel continues to bomb, because each time they land a bomb, tents will catch fire and 50 more civilians get killed and more opprobrium rains on Israel's head. And that there's a kind of no-win scenario there. And the ultimate game that gets... Uh, Israel to finish off Hamas in, in Rafa will be completely negated by the downside of so many more civilians being killed. Do you believe that the American intelligence is correct, that Hamas has now been degraded to the extent where there's no actual military point in continuing this? Well, that, that, that's a massive moving of the goalposts. Remember, the original goal of the war was to extirpate Hamas as the ruling authority in the Gaza Strip because they had built hundreds of kilometers of terror tunnels and they had access to... But I, I agree Hamas should be... I, I agree Hamas can't return to... Strip. Yeah. Let's agree that Hamas can't return to power. I don't think that is remotely ever going to be allowed to happen. And I would be t totally supportive of Israel. But do you not think that now is a moment for the deal to be done? And how obstructive to that deal is Netanyahu who Biden made pretty explicit that he believes that a lot of the reason that he's continuing the war is that at the end of it, he's out of a job because the Israelis want him to be held accountable for what happened, even though they support the war effort. Well, that, and, that's... Well, the polling does so, say that. Uh, a few things. One, one that's, that's wish casting. that's wish casting right over the Grand Canyon that exists where Hamas actually cuts a deal because there has to be somebody on no, the I other side that. of that deal. I, no, I understand that. I'm just saying whether you think that... So, <clears throat> I think Hamas have got to go. I also think that Netanyahu has to go. And I also think that Smodrich and, and Ben Gavir in that cabinet are spewing rhetoric and which plays into the hands of people who think Israel's being genocidal, which I don't think they are. And I think it's a ridiculous label to put aside them. But when you hear those guys talk, I, I would... It, look, I'm not Jewish. I'm not an Israeli. But I would be uncomfortable that, that they have another agenda going on here and that this not, doesn't reflect what well, most Israelis Well, they're not part of the war want. cabinet. I mean, the, the immediate war cabinet right now, I mean, just to get technical, the immediate war cabinet in Israel is Netanyahu, his mm -hmm. defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who's a member of Likud, and Benny Gantz, yeah. who's a member of his own party and the chief rival to Netanyahu for the prime ministership. Mm -hmm. So that government still exists. That may collapse in terms of the war cabinet. The actual sitting government of the state of Israel is, of course, a coalition government that does include right-wing parties who are calling on Netanyahu to finish the job. But again, if there were an optimal situation where Hamas leaves, where, Hamas, where the, the leadership of Hamas goes into exile and where some form of Gazan native leadership is brought up to bear, Israel, I think, pretty much along all lines, with maybe the exception of Smotrich and Ben Gavir, would be totally willing to do that. That deal is not on the table. I can't say this enough. What Joe Biden has been doing right now is actually an incredibly, incredibly dishonest tactic. He essentially walked out a deal that was vague on the central point of the negotiation, which is whether Hamas would go and how. And then he proclaimed that Israel had accepted it. And then he proclaimed that Israel should accept it. So question, if this was Israel's offer, as Joe Biden suggested that it was originally last Friday, why is he encouraging the Israelis to accept it? 
they made the offer. When was the last time you made an offer, Piers, that somebody then came back to you and said, Piers, will you accept the offer that you just made? If you make an offer, typically you're the one who made the offer, and yet all the pressure right now seems to be brought to bear on the Israeli government in the hope that presumably will break the internal coalition in Israeli politics. The, the truth is that right now, the Biden administration is putting an extraordinary focus on getting rid of Netanyahu, significantly more focused than they are on getting rid of Hamas, unfortunately, because the reality is Hamas is not going to surrender. Hamas is not going to give up the hostages so long as the hostages are the thing protecting them, they think, from being ousted in the Gaza Strip. The minute they give up the hostages, the reason they haven't gone through this multi-stage deal is because the minute they give up the remaining hostages, there is no reason for Israel not to extirpate them and finish them off. I mean, the reports from Israel are that, that Sinwar, who's the military leader of Hamas, still sitting in the Gaza Strip, has surrounded himself personally with the remaining living hostages. So again, this is an intractable situation. Only military pressure is going to end whatever rule Hamas has of the Gaza Strip. Hamas, as you and I both agree, cannot be the governing party in no. Gaza, nor should it be part of a selection committee in terms of the government in Gaza, I which agree. is something that had been floated before. The I idea agree. was that the PA and Hamas were somehow going to form a coalition government, which is insane. Yeah, I, 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 on that I completely agree. But should Netanyahu stay in power at the end of this? I mean, I think that the, the coalition, likely when the war is over, will in fact collapse. And I think that you probably will see a new election at that point. But Netanyahu is not the obstacle to, quote unquote, peace or a ceasefire. The obstacle would be the terrorist group currently holding hostages, including American citizens, women and the elderly. Who runs Gaza after this? I mean, it depends. Hamas has literally been killing the people who are bringing in the humanitarian aid. So there was a, a Gazan family that was working with the Israelis and working with the international community to get aid in, and Hamas literally went and killed them. So if Israel can identify locals who are willing to do local rule, as has been the case in some parts of the West Bank for years and years and years, then presumably Israel will do that. The question is, is there anyone there? And again, politics, unfortunately, is a series of bad decisions and worse decisions. The Israelis want nothing less than to station 30 to 40,000 troops in Gaza for the duration. They don't want that. But the problem is they can't hand it back over to a population that is 70 to 80 percent supportive of October 7th and Hamas in the hopes that that population will suddenly moderate and become a full-fledged flourishing member of the international community. They tried that in 2005, 2006, and they got October 7th for their troubles.